I'm Elisa Ogden. I farm and ranch in southeastern New Mexico with uh, now my brother, Craig Ogden. My family, the Four Hands, have been on this ranch since 1890. I'm fifth generation, and my son, J. Cody Stell, is sixth generation to live in this house. They came 22 years prior to statehood and settled on this area. We always wondered, why here? <laughs> But you know, you have to think back that 128 years ago, it looked a whole lot different than it does now. The Homestead Act then, you could homestead 160 acres and you got the mineral rights that were under the 160 acres. So the Smith family came to this part of the country in 1932. My great grandparents, settled here and homesteaded. Every rock on this house, which started out as a dirt floor and screen porch uh, until my dad was a junior in high school, but all these rocks came from Smith Ranch when my great-grandparents came to this country and homesteaded with a covered wagon and two dogs and a donkey at 14 and 12 and unmarried and set out west to start a family ranching operation. Five generations later, we've acquired several pieces of land to come up with 270 square miles of ranch property here in southeastern New Mexico. You take 3,556 oil bells that are on Smith Ranch today, and you match that against the development that is fixing to happen. You're looking at well over 12,000 oil wells in a very small populated area of 270 square miles. In the Permian Basin in southeastern New Mexico is one of the country's premier oil regions. Um, West Texas and southeast New Mexico um, is an area that's undergoing a tremendous amount of development right now. Um, the past year, $13 billion worth of investment uh, by the oil and gas industry in southeastern New Mexico. Production in this area was a record last year. In New Mexico alone, 171 million barrels. And this year it'll probably come in at 225 or 230 million barrels. And if you want some perspective on that, a decade ago we only produced 60 million barrels. Uh, it is absolutely amazing. Can it continue? Yes, of course it can continue. And you can tell that because the big players, the big oil companies are here and have put a lot of money into oil leases and they're not about to lose that. The Permian Basin, as you're well aware, includes the Delaware Basin of Southeast New Mexico and West Texas, as well as the Midland Basin and the Central Basin Platform in Texas. And it's currently clearly the most exciting and active oil play in the country, and I would argue in the world. Just a few weeks ago, we were projecting a $200 million budget surplus. Now, it has already grown to over $330 million. So again, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do. And because of that, we will have a $1.2 billion surplus when I leave office. In the past few years, we've really seen an explosion of oil and gas development in the Permian Basin. And in fact, uh, there are projections that within a few years, this region will, will be the third largest oil producing region in the world after Saudi Arabia and Russia. A dramatic change in the amount of production going on here. So my name is Clay Bretches, and I am the president of Sendero Midstream. We're operating gas processing plants and a gas gathering system in southeast New Mexico. The amount of resource that we have is stunning. It is transformational for this country. What we don't have enough of in the Permian Basin, particularly in southeast New Mexico, is the infrastructure to get that resource base out. We don't have enough pipelines. We don't have enough gas processing plants. We don't have enough export facilities. All of that has to be built, and that's great. That's a wonderful thing. It's a great opportunity for many, many companies.
I'm Sheriff Mark Cage. I'm the Sheriff of uh, Eddy County, New Mexico. And I've been Sheriff for going on two years now. Before that, I was under Sheriff for four years under uh, Sheriff Scott London. It's amazing how much money that the oil and gas industry pumps into the economy of Eddy County. They really care. And it, it's obvious. We, we receive donations to the sheriff's office to help us buy equipment, to help support us. Um, we've built parks with money donated from oil field companies. We do amazing things here, and a lot of it has to do with oil and gas. So this is a new tank battery that is going in for some of what they call their super pads that they're getting permitted for 16 wells per location. This was an old traditional vertical well was what it was supposed to be. Those well pad locations were three and a half acres. That was the standard. Well, I got 3,556 of those out here. We still pay grazing on every bit of that. Now we've got the drill island concept. They will tell you that the footprint has decreased two and a half acres for every well hole. What they're not saying is there's gonna be 160 wells on that. All of this on a vertical well, that was the contained facility. Tank batteries, everything was right there on that three and a half acres. This real island concept, which I supported, I was the first rancher to publicly support it. But we're not following the parameters that were originally put in place because that two and a half, 2.6 acres that they're claiming now is multiplied 7.3 times. I'm Jim Goodmar and I'm a resident here in Carlsbad, New Mexico. I've moved here in 1977 and been caving here since the mid-1960s. I pretty much grew up caving. My mom and dad were cavers, and I've just spent uh, my whole life caving. I got a job with the Bureau of Land Management uh, doing cave work and cave resources management, and have spent uh, 38 and a half years doing that. I just now retired, so that's pretty good. On the starboard bow is the Carlsbad Caverns National Park headquarters. With all the, the lineup of tanks and sand, and so what's going on there is that they're fracking that uh, particular well. Behind me are sand silos. The sand is used for fracking wells, and most of the sand is brought in from Wisconsin on trains. They put in two new rail systems to bring in the sand. There are six sand silos per complex, and there are four of these brand new complexes to hold the sand until they're taken out to the rigs for fracking. You go back to 2010 with the last census and Eddy County showed about approximately 55,000. Talking about maybe 25,000 in Carlsbad, 13,000 I believe it was for Artesia. That, that's nowhere close now. Talking with Mayor Janway of Carlsbad, what he is estimating is there's over 70,000 people in the Carlsbad area alone. The burden is amazing. We're understaffed here. The city police department is severely understaffed. They're, they're, they're just overrun. And it's because of the huge influx. We're set up in Eddy County, we're set up for 55,000 people as far as law enforcement goes and many other services go. Do we have 100,000 people here? Yes. It becomes overwhelming. The huge influx, and we, we're seeing these man camps pop up and People that live in the county are very resistant to zoning because they don't want the regiment of living in a city. But the problem is when there are no zoning rules, then other things happen that the folks out there see as undesirable. You get folks come in from Oklahoma, Louisiana, folks from out of town. These folks are going and they're getting in their fifth wheels and they're going to bed so they can get a little bit of sleep 
and get up and go back to work the next day. So they'll be converting this from alfalfa into this workforce camp. So with the utilities going in here, and you could have as much as perhaps 20 different trailers in here, and each one of the trailers will be going, paying anywhere from 800 to $1,000 a month, then that would wind up being close to $250,000 a year for a two and a half acre piece of land, which would be a lot more than you could make by raising alfalfa on it. The Permian Basin is booming right now, and that's brought a lot more activity in the oil industry. And so the whole region over there, especially uh, Eddy and Lee counties, that's Carlsbad and Hobbs, is booming. Go try to rent a hotel room in either of those cities. You'll pay a higher price there than you might in Washington, D.C. or L.A. Oh, I got up this morning and the smell of money was in the air. So I live right across from my oil well. It was pumping and sometimes the odor mixed with the cattle is good for Lee County. It's money, 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 money. But for some people, it's not. The housing here in Hobbs, it's ridiculous, the pricing. When I first came back from Lubbock, Texas, the housing was $2,200. I went and looked at a house that normally would have ran for $400 a month. It was $2,200. It was a three-bedroom, ran-down house. And, and it's all because of the oil here. It, when the oil boosts, then the housing, the pricing, the food, everything goes up. And they exaggerate the price because of the oil field here. And if you don't work in the oil field, you can't make it. You know, how you going to, on a minimum wage job, how can you make it off for $8 an hour? It's almost an epidemic here. Uh, people are not having anywhere to stay and uh, not having anything to eat. It's just really put a strain on, on the on the quality of life uh, in this town. Right now, today, there are 31 homes for sale in Carlsbad, 31. There should be over 300 for a, a town our size. There's no rental property, zero. Zero rental property in Eddy County. We just built an apartment complex, probably, I don't know, 150, 200 units. It's sublet out already to an oil field company. And, and some of them will sit empty because they just have a marker holding that room because they might have someone coming in. We have not grown as fast as the oil and gas industry has grown. And that is hard on everyone. The impact on the infrastructure, the community as a whole, the schools are overwhelmed with the number of students. You look at what's happening out on US 285, the Highway 285 out there. They call it the Highway of Death. Some people say, oh, that's inflammatory, that, that's it. No, <laughs> actually they're understating how bad it is out there. We were dealing with one to two fatalities every one to two weeks. That's unacceptable. The South Y is a nightmare. It's where National Parks splits off onto 285. 42,000 vehicles a day go through that intersection. We didn't even used to have 42,000 people in Carlsbad. Now we have that many vehicles in their trucks, their cars, their pickups, their gang trucks, you name it, they're going through there. And compound that with a sinkhole underneath it. And you've got these big 18-wheelers, you've got the water trucks, you've got air, because we don't have a bypass. There's no bypass. They're coming right straight through Carlsbad. They're going pounding on that sinkhole. We're fortunate it hadn't fallen. And I've driven through there at five o'clock, six o'clock in the afternoon. You'll sit for 20 minutes just to move a couple of miles. We get people that get frustrated because they're behind two semis and they try and pass and they end up passing on a hill and we have a head-on collision and people die. You see all these skid marks? <laughs> this is people going, oh my God, I'm gonna die. Hey, see, here's what they've done. They've made their own road. This is normal. This is normal business here. You go out there, you take your life in your hands. There has to be a reaction from the state and federal government. The county is overwhelmed 
and they cannot do everything that's required to do uh, in order to handle all of the traffic that's going on. Once they've completed their wells, they have an abundant amount of produced water. And so they either put it in a pipeline or the trucks truck it off to a facility who will go in and they will process that produced water. They'll skim off whatever petroleum products they can and then they inject it in the ground. The uh, water then is pretty nasty and it can't be used for anything else. And so they'll bring it and they'll pump it back down into a much, much deeper formation, which is quite a bit deeper than any of the oil and gas plays that there are. So that water that they use, that is either rainwater, river water, wherever they get the water from, will never see the light of day again and can never be used for anything else. Well, there's so much of that produced water that they're having facilities that will just inject it and not even go in and cleans it up. The Oil Conservation Division does the permitting for the saltwater disposals. They do not take into consideration the terrain, the proximity to rivers, anything. They look on a map and they have the sections laid out. And this is something that we're advocating and trying to get the Oil Conservation Division, OCD, to change. Most of these drivers are paid by the load, not by the hour. So the faster they can get to a facility, unload, and pick up another load, the more they're paid. So all of this is, plays into the amount of produced water, that uh, uh, the illegal dumping. So my easy plan, have the operator in control of it till it's t taken to a facility, and I think there would be less problems with, with the illegal dumping of it. So in the Carlsbad area, 98% of the water for the city of Carlsbad, our, all of our drinking water comes from the Captain Reef Aquifer. And as such, we're gonna need to be drinking that water for I guess the next couple of hundred years. We're always gonna need water. And I don't believe we're gonna be able to drink oil. So ultimately it comes down to a value choice. How do we wanna use our water? There's no one right way to use water. And I think it's really important for communities, a farming community that wants to grow alfalfa, to make their own decision about what they want to do with the water they have to support the economy and lifestyles they have. So if a community wants to have an oil and gas drilling economy, then that's how they want to use some of their water. I think that's kind of their choice. It's a working ranch. It's a horse named Buddy. He's an excellent trail horse, and uh, he has ridden out there along the old El Paso highways, uh, which is a, a, a dirt rocky trail at the base of the Lincoln National Forest. And I'd like you to meet my good friend Stetson Lewis. Uh, Stetson's a, a champion bull rider. Go, 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 get her out, get her out. I'm a cowboy, and I'm a professional bull rider, and I've got friends and family that work within the oil and gas industry. I had a friend die out there in the oil field. I've had a few friends die out there in the oil field during work-related accidents. Um, my brother uh, works for a pipeline. He's a foreman out there in Carlsbad. And uh, there is a plant explode that he was working on out there in Orla. I think there could be a lot of, a lot of things done differently. Uh, with work-related accidents, you know, there should be more safety regulations. I think those engineers out there that deal with the, the pipelines and uh, all the chemicals and everything that go in those plants and stuff could, could do something differently. You know, I'm, I'm no engineer, I'm just a cowboy, but, you know, it's pretty hard whenever you lose friends out there and you hear a bunch of stories of guys dying out there and, uh, you know, you see a plant explode and uh, you think you lost two brothers. In, a, in an inferno. I know quite a few of those guys that, you know, they're heavy drug addicts because the hours they work, they have to stay up all night long. We have some actual major crime out in the Ophir. We have petty crime and we have major crime, but it impacts everybody and it's different than in Texas. Texas, a lot of these, these, these sites are on private land. In New Mexico, it's public land we can't fence them out. So they're coming in and the problem is we're trying to protect people from themselves as well. People are getting electrocuted 
by pulling copper wire that is a live circuit. They're, they're pulling it out of these pump jacks. We're talking millions of dollars in oil field theft, and they're getting electrocuted and killed. They're climbing on the pump jacks, which are, are still, but they're, they're on a cycle, they're on a timer, and they start up and people get maimed and killed on top of these pump jacks. Some of the kids that go out there just playing around, horsing around. Having been born and raised in the southeastern part of New Mexico, my parents, having migrated from Mexico and settled in the southeastern part of the state, oil and gas has brought years of, of wealth into, into my family. But what I have also seen are the years in which um, oil and gas isn't doing so well. And I see it within our schools, how our schools are suffering. I see it within our land. I see how different the landscape has changed in southeastern New Mexico, where now it's super desolate. and. I worry about what this land is going to look like in 100 years. I worry about what sacrifices my community has had to make in order for just a few people, stakeholders, to be able to profit. My fear is that as oil and gas continues to be a mainstay in our state, we have um, perpetuated this narrative that there is just not enough for everybody and so when it comes to issues around oil and gas in the industry we have communities that are so reliant on it and for their livelihood to put food on the table that they will do just about anything to maintain that um, that status quo and manipulate that 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 narrative my name is Arthur Blazer but from day one, people have known me as Butch. That's my nickname. As we sit here uh, today, this beautiful day, on my beautiful reservation here uh, in Mescalero, New Mexico, uh, I want to share with you that, you know, over the course of my career, I've been very blessed to have had the opportunity to not only work for my tribe, the Mescalero Apache tribe, but I've had the opportunity to work for the state of New Mexico. I've had opportunities to work with federal agencies. Through that experience, I have gained the understanding of the importance of working together. We all recognize that a large part of our budget within our state comes from the oil and gas industry. And knowing that, knowing the importance of that, as tribal people, we're concerned about our environment, how this industry impacts uh, our reservation lands, our air, our water. And so again, uh, looking at the importance of the income that it provides to our states that, that we want to figure out how to, how to utilize we are also concerned that there's a balance and that the oil and gas industry understands our concerns and that's why we would like to have a seat at the table in those discussions. The opportunity we have is we've got this world-class resource. Um, we need to also develop a top-tier regulatory structure to match. Um, the state historically has lagged in that regard. Um, the state's main oil and gas regulator today doesn't even have the ability to issue administrative penalties for violations of uh, environmental laws. Um, so it's, it's basically a traffic cop that can't write speeding tickets currently. Quite frankly, we believe regulations need to be very strong, very tight, because we don't want any bad actors in our industry that somehow kill this golden goose. I actually was part of a study in 2009 to 2011 with the National Petroleum Council in which we made strong recommendations to not only the industry but the, the, the federal and state governments that we raise the bar with regard to practices by the industry as well as by regulators so that we could continue to see the bar raised with regard to oil and gas regulations. Um, you know, methane is another one where neighboring states have stepped up to regulate methane emissions, to reduce pollution, to reduce the waste of natural gas resources. Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity again for New Mexico to step up as well while this huge boom is happening uh, to make sure we're maximizing its benefit. I am certified to use a camera that makes 
visible the invisible methane pollution coming from oil and gas facilities. As you can see out here, a lot of these facilities are not being regulated. The regulation out here is pretty lax, if there's any regulation at all. And there's a consequence to that. Even though this may be a rural area, people who live in rural areas, they need their health protected too. And we know that these kind of emissions cause health impacts. They also have a consequence for our climate. And a lot of what is blasting out here should be captured and sold because there again, that money could be used for New Mexico schools. We need oil and gas. I don't know how many people have actually stepped foot in the oil field, but I'm pretty certain that oil and gas eats beef. We need each other, but what we need is management together that is collaborative, just like we're doing on the environmental and sportsman side. I am all for energy independence. I have, I'm, I'm grateful that we have the technology available and the ability to use that technology in order to be energy independent. My only concern is in our rush to be energy independent, we're also respectful of the land around us, not to the detriment of either those who are multi-use people, grazing, agriculture, recreation, oil and gas, that it be a collaborative effort all the way around in order to, to utilize all aspects of our surface and be respectful of the generations to come that'll be using it also. So we're very hopeful that in the state of New Mexico, as we enter into this next gubernatorial election, that the next governor will engage stronger to help raise the bar, help industry, help the regulators to have a higher bar, to have better environmental regulations with regard to oil and natural gas. And we think that's going to be better for all of us. I hope my grandchildren grow up here. I hope they get to enjoy Eddy County and the things that we have to offer up at Queen and the Guadalupe Mountains, the river, the lake. We have so much here to offer. I want to see us invest in that future. We have a lot of money coming in and I encourage the folks that I talk with on a daily basis, let's invest in our future because our kids are going to be here. They're inheriting all this from us. I left New Mexico for a time and close to 10 years ago decided to come back because I knew that despite what politics has done and how polarized it has become that if we're able to continue to build community and find this collective unity that I'm hopeful that New Mexico can become the state that we've always dreamed of. So God blessed me with one son, J. Cody Still. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and he's now a first lieutenant. And so he eventually wants to come back to farm on the farm that we've had since 1916, the Ogdens, and ranch on the ranch that the Forehands homesteaded in 1890. But the question is, what will be there when he finishes his 20 years he hopes to do in the Marine Corps? What will the ability be there to to ranch when he makes that decision to return. At the end of the day, when time is, has passed on, whether it's my family, your family, there's only one thing that you ought to leave behind in your life. And that's something for the future generations to benefit from. Oil and gas is a non-renewable resource. We need it to be able to provide something for the children of the future, for the future generations, but not at the expense of today's generation. What do I want out of it? I want our federal and state agencies to follow the laws as they're published. I want to bring awareness to the fact that we're not. I can't bring back Smith Ranch, but maybe we can gain enough knowledge and information of the truth and the reality that is happening out here to save some of the future generation's opportunities.
80 years later, my family has had to make some difficult decisions as the ranch property uh, on public and state trust lands with oil and gas development is shrinking. And some of us have to move on to the next chapter of our lives. Hubcap.